is to study with a, Br a British team and an Iraqi team together a small archaeological site in the south of the country near the very famous ancient city of Ur. And that's what I want to be talking to you about today. So when the archaeologists decided, so four years ago now, when Iraq was very peaceful before anyone had ever heard of ISIS, that it, um, to start a, a new project in the south, it was the first project that anybody outside Iraq had been um, uh, planning since really before the, um, the Iraq War of 1990-91. So this is an incredible first. To get back working with Iraqis in their country to do what's essentially local history. So the, the field archaeologists, that's not me, I'm not a field archaeologist as you'll see, were looking for a site that was manageable, and that meant not too big, not too far away from good resources, likely to produce interesting results. And the site they ended up with was a site whose ancient name we still don't know, but its modern Arabic name is Tel Heba. And it's about 20 kilometers from ancient Ur, and that's really important for several reasons, not least of it, which is that there are really good facilities at Ur for archaeologists, and we use that as our base every year. The other reason that they picked Heba is, as you can see from the um, satellite imagery, um, is that um, it's quite small. And uh, could we dim the lights at the front here so that we can, people can see the screen properly? Or have I got control of that? See if I have. See if that works. Is that better, oh, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Better. OK. So on the image behind me, if you look closely, you might be able to see the outlines of a building right under the surface that shows up on the satellite imagery. Right, so there are the contour lines that have been imposed on it, but there's a diagonally, can you see a, 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 the outlines of a building? So the archaeologists knew before they ever set foot there that, the building, that there was going to be good archaeology there. And in the very first exploratory season, indeed, that building came to light just by scraping the surface. That building in that very first season back in 2012 also produced documentary evidence, much to everyone's surprise. Clay tablets written in cuneiform script, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. Luckily for me, I happened to be in Iraq at the time. I was in Baghdad doing uh, work for the British Institute. And Jane Moon, one of the uh, project co-directors, called me up. I was planning to visit anyway, just to see what they were doing, because we were funding them at the point, that point, and said, well, you're going to make yourself useful when you get down here because we have things that, and that no one of, of us can read and we need you. So really, by accident, I became the epigrapher, the um, decipherer, on this amazing project, which, has, as you'll see, has produced some really extraordinary results so far. So archaeology works at two levels. There's an on-site team. So these are the people who dig the stuff up, to put it very crudely. Um, they're wrapped up warm, that may seem surprising to you, but in the south of Iraq, in the early mornings, in January and February, it's very, very cold. So the, uh, the Brits and the Iraqis on site are surveying the site. They're doing the excavation, finding things, mapping buildings. They're doing chemical analysis of the, of the soil. That tells you a lot of, of useful information. And, of course, documenting what they see. And then off-site, in... A, in a house and in a rather uh, un unassuming porter cabin within the um, secure uh, area of the, uh, the archaeological site of Ur, there's us, the off-site team. So there are people um, registering uh, objects as they come in, photographing them. That's what's going on behind the purple curtain at the top there. Adrian, our photographer, is not visible. Julia, our conservator, makes sure everything is robust enough for us to handle. Dan analyzes the pots, and I decipher the uh, documents. And every day at 2.30, the archaeologists come back with crates full of more stuff and say to me, oh, what have you read today then? Tell us about what you found. So it's all very exciting. And at the end of the season, everything gets packed up, the site is covered over, ready for next year, and the objects that we found go up to Baghdad for safekeeping in the museum there. So that means, too, that photography on site is really important so that we can continue working afterwards. So what have we found so far? So by the time we've, um, the field workers stopped digging at the end of March, 
they'd uncovered, amongst other things, most of this enormous building that you see here. It's divided into two parts. This bottom part here was the original bit. It's only got one entrance and the middle there. Um, and you'll see it's surrounded by these very, very odd things that at first they, the archaeologists thought were just buttresses holding this enormously thick wall up. But all of these buttresses are hollow and they're filled with things. And they may, at least one of them has an, has an entrance. So they're a little bit perplexing. There's nothing at all like them. At some point, the building got extended up to the north. Now, we don't know much about that yet because it hasn't yet been excavated. So we don't really understand exactly what was going on inside it. So it's this bottom half I want to talk about. Now, we can date the building, not because of the bricks made of it. Bricks are just bricks in, it, in ancient Iraq, but because of the objects found in and around it, particularly in the mysterious buttress rooms. And despite it being a big building, it wasn't a posh building. The objects all found are really very crude and simple. So lots of uh, uh, drinking vessels and eating things. So kitchenware, very crude, rough kitchenware, basically. And there are lots of images of prayer. So this naked woman may look a little bit salacious, but she is praying for, for milk for her baby. Well, that's a common image, right? In, in, in antiquity, with, with um, food often scarce, then worries about um, child health are um, endemic, not surprisingly. Images, image of a goddess to pray to, an image of a praying king. And this is really interesting because we can date this sort of image very, very precisely. These are all little things, these plaques. They're about this big, and they're mass-made in moulds. And they were probably painted in antiquity, though that paint's long gone. So this guy, this king, here, you will see is almost exactly the same as the famous king of Babylonia, King Hammurabi, who ruled in the early 18th century BC. Now, the big purple blotch over here is, is the extent of his territories that he'd conquered pretty much all of the river Euphrates up to the border with modern-day Syria and most of Iraq south of Baghdad by about 1762 BC. So he was incredibly effective. He was a very good diplomat. We have letters of his showing how well he played off mutual enemies to fight each other and then he could come in after the battle was over and, and scoop up the spoils. So he was a very effective military tactician as well and then spent a lot of time and care thinking about how to manage this new empire once he'd conquered it. And the famous laws of Hammurabi are, are his programmatic statement about how he is planning to rule. So here he is in front of the god of justice, the sun god, Shamash, receiving the, um, the symbols of, of just fair kingship. So all well and good in about 1750 BC, so stop and think about that for a minute. That is well over a thousand years before ancient Greece was at its height. That is a long time ago. Before Tutankhamun, several hundred years before Tutankhamun. His son, Samsuriluna, was not so successful, and gradually the territories under Babylon's control began to drift away under, their, under local power, or particularly in the south, conquered by a new dynasty, um, called, well, we have no records of the time, or at least we didn't. They're known in later Babylonian tradition as the Sealanders or the Marshland dynasty. So from about 1730 or so, for a couple of hundred years, the south of Iraq is a dark age in the sense that we don't have any documentary evidence from that period. And it was the standard hist historian story is that the south was just pretty much abandoned and that, that there was no... There were people living there, but there were no big urban settlements there and no writing. So back to our building. And back to the south half. So the key built piece is this room here, room 300, where the, our cuneiform tablets turned up the very, in that very first season and more and more every year. We haven't finished excavating yet. When I go back in February, I'll be expecting more, so the story's not finished. So all of our tablets come from this room. They were probably produced in this room, they, or at least physically made. They were probably written in the open-air courtyard because there's no, no light, no natural light source in this archive room. So the objects 
really stayed where they were made for about three and a half thousand years, more or less. Now, we know that this was dedicated archive room because of this rather interesting feature in it. It's a recycling bin. This is quite common in um, places of scribal production in um, early Mesopotamia. They were writing on clay, and clay can be reused very easily by soaping. So these sorts of bins were kept, and whenever you didn't need a document anymore, you'd rip it up into little pieces, chuck it in the recycling bin for soaking, and then scoop up when you needed to make a new tablet, scoop up the clay and reuse it. Also, another parenthetical comment, in, any, in case anyone's worried about security, the British Embassy in, a, in Baghdad are big supporters of ours, and here's the Deputy Ambassador coming to visit us last time. She's, Belinda is a huge supporter of the work we're doing, and uh, very engaged in, in the finds as well. So archeolo our archaeological team are great at plotting exactly where they find things, horizontally and um, vertically, and we can see, before I start to explain the different coloured dots, that the tablets are not found randomly in the room. Right? So they've mostly been working in the north area. This bit down here is for January and February. That's what they're going to be doing uh, in a couple of months' time. But you can see that the tablets aren't random. We've got discrete clusters of finds. So it looks as though they were stored separately, perhaps in reed baskets or in bags or some organic material that doesn't survive, right? And then there's a little cluster of things around the recycling bin. And those ones, the little green dots, are all teeny tiny things, stuff that could easily have been dropped and forgotten, right? The big tablets are all around the edge. So I'm going to talk about the, the, um, the green and blue and purple dots now, and we'll come back to the orange ones at the end. So... Cuneiform writing on clay is one of the most enduring writing technologies in world history. We have um, tablets from just before 3000 BC to just after 2000 BC. It's a complicated script if looked at from the outside, but most people most of the time just used a small selection. In the period we're talking about, the language of everyday writing was Akkadian split into southern Babylonian dialect and northern Assyrian dialect. Although the script's very different, it's closely related linguistically in spoken language to modern Hebrew and Arabic and other Middle Eastern languages. Then there's a language called Sumerian, which has no surviving relatives, which is um, really just used for um, scholarship at this period. It's a bit like sort of the equivalent of Latin or Greek. So what have we got? Typically, two-thirds of our tablets look like this. Right? They're actually a bit bigger than my little microphone thing here. They, on the face of it, I look, they're very, very structured. They've got headings. They've got lists of people presumably receiving quantities of grain. But there's no verb. We don't know whether the grain's being received or given. Lots of different individuals, 150 or 160 in total in the whole archive identified typically by profession, mostly rural professions, or by family name, and usually just to distinguish one from each other. So we've got two Ahi Ilikams here, son of somebody whose name I can't read yet, somebody who's a carpenter. A couple of scribes, so we've got professionally literate people too. We've got these people certainly... Is that going to move on? Yes, it's just thinking about it. Sorry, just bear with me a second. Um, some of these people were certainly involved in harvest. We've got tables showing quantities of grain owed, amounts coming in, and then any difference that they still owe. In this document, as in most of them, everyone's good and delivers what they, they can. But these aren't professional um, harvesters, leather workers, reed workers, carpenters, smiths, bird catchers, fishermen, shepherds, date palm gardeners, oil pressers, cooks, washermen, Heralds, musicians, okay? So, mostly rural, dispersed community, probably, who are pressed into the harvest, lend a helping hand. Whether that's voluntary or um, compulsory, we can't tell at the moment. But as well as them, we've got a group of professional farmers, ten of them, who occur again and again in our documents, but always written separately, either on different tablets um, or 
you can see, you can see there's, a, there's a clear line there. If they're on the same tablet as the casual laborers, they're um, always marked out separately. And again, we don't know yet whether they're landowners who are paying tax with their harvest, their tenants paying rent, or whether they're state dependents who are doing this because they have to. The documentation doesn't tell us, and those three models uh, are commonly um, posed by historians. So that's most of what we've got, right? Very, very um, surprisingly casual records compared to most places um, in early Mesopotamia. We sometimes have dates, but no one ever, there's no official authority, right, describing who's responsible. As I said, there's no record of whether these things are coming in or out. Most of the time we have to infer. And then if, so the, our only clue as to who's in charge is the one, t one tiny, tiny letter, which is also taking a while to come up. Sorry, my laptop's slow. Here we are. So it's written on a piece of clay about that big, organized like that. And that's literally all it says. So it's addressed to Artanachili, who is one of our scribes, right? So interestingly. And it's from somebody who is not a scribe. Now, there are three different men with this name in our archive. Right? Uh, one is a cook. One is the son, is always described as the son of uh, somebody. Um, and someone who's never given a, a special description. Um, and so it's pretty clear that, and we know that there are three different people because they often occur on the same tablets. So the guy that probably needs no further description is probably the boss, right? Because everyone knows who he is. But he's not too bossy because, look, he refers to the scribe as brother. And that doesn't, that's, again, a common convention. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, family brother. It means social equal. So it's a pretty relaxed place, and yet not entirely relaxed because they are documenting so why are they bothering to document, and why have they got this enormous building? For actually, what's not very much grain, they're looking at, there's a few hundred litres at a time maximum. Right? Well, the clue comes in the next tiny little fragment, and about half a dozen like it, and that is we have a few recording deliveries to the palace. Most grain is probably stored locally because there are a couple of records like this one describing old grain. Right? So that may have been what was in the big bit of the rest of the building. We don't know yet. We don't know either because everyone knew when they were locally where the palace was, who was in charge there. Right? So we don't know whether it means a particular building or a more abstract institution. But it is probable, very, very probable, that the place they mean was the city of Ur, which, as we saw before, is only 20 kilometers away. And if you look closely, you might just be able to see on this Google map a, a satellite image, a line running from Tel Haber down towards Ur. That's the ancient, an ancient water course. So there's a canal connecting the two places. Sometimes, too, you'll see in a sec, there are little documents recording grain measured by the royal measure. So that also suggestive, there we are, that there's a, a, the palace is involved. And we can go better than that, though. Because here are our farmers again on another typical tabular account um, with a date on. So we've only got three tablets with dates on. Now, before about 1500 BC, people didn't didn't count years, they named them. So it was the king's prerogative to name the year after an important military or religious event. This year is the accession year of this king, Ayadara Galama. Well, who's he? Well, he is the eighth king of the Sealand dynasty. Right? So later tradition tells us. So this is our first excavated evidence for the Sealand dynasty as they uh, were working. So we don't know very much about them yet, but this is our first clue that even in the countryside, <coughs> the dynasty has agricultural production centers either working directly for them or paying taxes to them. Now, we can't take this exactly 
but it is probably likely that Ayadaragalama was a contemporary of the very last king of Babylon, Samsuditana, or the very first king of the dynasty that conquered Babylon after it fell. Um, so that puts it, depend, uh, the, chronology, the exact chronology is a little bit difficult, but it puts it between about 1720 and 1500 BC. So let's call it 1600, call it quick. So, I say it was the first excavated material because, unfortunately, because of the um, very difficult economic and political situation in Iraq over the past 25 years, there has been quite a lot of uh, illegal digging for objects. And there are academics in the world who are comfortable with working with illicit material, who um, think that preserving their, um, the, the textual evidence is, is worth it for colluding with um, criminal excellence. Leave you to make your mind up about that. So, about six years ago, illegally ta excavated tablets from the same period were published. And this is a rather bad photograph from the book from them. Of course, because they were illegally <coughs> excavated, nobody knew where they were from. Um, Precisely, but they are very similar to our formerly excavated, properly excavated materials. They are not from our site. Our site has never been touched by looters. And they're, but they're much more elaborate than ours as well. Although they are tablets, um, have the same formatting, the same, some of the same types of documentation. So the Hargalu grain is very particular to this, and the little holes marked in the empty cells of the tables. Um, the dates match precisely as well. So we have dates from Ayadaragalama, the king, too. Our guys, so these, these are written by very competent experts. Our guys are not. Perhaps you saw in one of the earlier tablets, and you can see more clearly now, our guys aren't very good either at making tablets that are the right size for what they want to record, or for keeping their tablets moist enough to write on. Right? So quite typically, the backs are really difficult to read because the tablets are drying out as they write. Right? These are not very competent scribes. Right? They're just raw, in a rural backwater water, trying to live up to the standards imposed on them by central authority. So now we come to the last couple of slides. And what was to me was the genuine surprise and the real excitement. So when I first arrived at the site... Last February, the excavators had been working for six weeks or so and had had a whole, gosh, 40 or so tablets for me to look at. And the first one I picked up, a teeny little piece of frag fragmentary thing, and I was expecting to see Akkadian language numbers and names like all the others. And I saw the Sumerian word for elephant. And I thought, no, I've misread this. And so I put it down. I thought, no, I'm, I'm jet-lagged, right? I'll have another look at another one. And I picked up the next one. And it was Sumerian again, and it said lapis lazuli. And I thought, oh, this is really, really odd. Gradually, it became clear that absolutely uniquely, in this archive room, as well as the administrative archive tablets, there was a little bit of schooling going on. And all the little orange dots in the corner here represent the remains of somebody being trained, not in the administration that they need, but in the high culture of Babylonian and Sumerian tradition that had been running for one and a half thousand years already. So these guys, although they are in a world of carpenters and wood woodworkers and reed workers and, and harvesters, at least there are at least two people in that community who are imaginatively an entirely other world, right? thinking of the exotic world the faraway world where carnelian and lapis lazuli and, chlor and chlorite come from, where there are bisons and elephants and lions and hippopotamuses. Now, this is a standard exercise which begins with learning all the words for things made of reed and things made of wood and things made of stone, the sorts of things that are and pottery, the sorts of things that these guys are surrounded by all the time. But interestingly, they choose not to teach their youngsters how to write that. They're living in this entirely different imaginative world. And this is incredibly exciting too, because until now, until this, this discovery last February, 
all our evidence was that this sort of scribal schooling happened in big cities. Right? So I did a lot of work on this in the late 90s and early 2000s. That this sort of writing is a really urban phenomenon, this intellectual engagement. It happens in priests' houses most of the time, right? not in harvest archives. It's extraordinary and really incredibly exciting. But it also very interestingly fills, also fills a chronological gap for, for us between the 18th and 17th centuries, where we know quite well, and about the 14th century, when our records pick up again, where the texts are really kind of have, have not surprisingly undergone some sort of transformation. Again, this is an exciting middle ground. So, to sum up, we've got then a very unassuming, in some ways, agricultural centre in which everyone knows each other, they're documenting because they have to, but they do the bare minimum compared to what else is going on. And yet, and they're in this enormous building which could have been seen for miles around in the very flat landscape. So we've got a core... Guy, team of ten, our guys, they, they're known as in the team. You can name them individually. But we don't know what their relationship to the palace was. But we do know that at harvest time, they recruit every male able-bodied man around to come and help them with the harvest. Right? This is a time at which the rivers flood too. So it needs to be carefully managed. And the guys are documenting this. They're not writing every day, all day. They're presumably doing other things too terribly good at it. They're good enough to do what they uh, need to, but really, I'm sure the palace scribes, as they ever received their documentation, would have kind of sneered at the, the quality of the writing. And yet, they're, they're aspiring to be members of, of the scribal class, um, situating themselves as this incredibly long and uh, erudite tradition that began, begins in the late 4th millennium BC and will continue right up until just um, less than 2,000 years ago. So those, I say, preliminary conclusions because the project's ongoing. The excavators are going back in early January. I'll be joining them in reading week in the middle of, um, middle of next term in order to do a quick 10 days of fast decipherment and photography before the tablets disappear and I come back to teach again. And then we'll have another, at least one more season in the year after that. We do a lot of work with local communities um, in English and in Arabic. Um, it's been very frustrating trying to get mainstream media attention in the UK, though, because it's not part of the war narrative. And then, frustratingly, no, no, there are no media stories in good, new, good news from Iraq at the moment. But if you're interested in following us, there is um, a fairly static website, archaeology.org, with the basic information. Facebook page gets up, updated by Jane Moon very regularly. She and I both tweet very regularly about what we're doing too. So you can continue to see uh, our discoveries as they go. And very finally, we are heavily dependent on lots of money and practical support from all sorts of people. Um, University of Manchester, UCL, British Institute for the Study of Iraq, the Iraqi State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, Foreign Office, and lots and lots of private companies and foundations too. So, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, are there any questions? We have one. Here, can you wait a second? A mic will be coming your way. <clears throat> ah. um, well, actually, I've got two questions. Uh, first of all, you've uh, got this uh, building that you've excavated. Um, why did it end? Uh, was it like the end of the Roman Empire where the cash didn't turn up so no one uh, bothered to turn up? That's a really good question. So, what we think happened, um, we're going to go back and test it next year, is that the, I mentioned the, um, very briefly the, the, the conquest of northern Babylonia in about 1500 BC by a group called the Kassites, and they came south as well, and we think that's what brought that building to an end. But we know that the local people then moved just a couple of miles down the road, and the team, team have done a little bit of work on that site too, which is later. So it looks like 
the big building which served a palace got abandoned when the, the dynasty got driven out. And so the people then just relocated and set up again, doing their usual farming, minding their own business. You know. It's very interesting that the local population always kind of endures somehow. Yeah, they left their gods behind as well. That's, you know, mm? you say they left their gods behind. You, know, you, uh, you said that, uh, you know, those things... Oh, know. but they're tiny. They're not really... They're not... I mean, they're just for little things at home. It's like having a crucifix at home. They're, they're quite disposable things. They're not made... They're not big statues of gods. There's not a... We no, don't but they're more easily takeable, aren't they? I mean, so if you uh, leave great big whacking statue behind I can understand yeah. but so uh, you know a small thing like that so uh, just take they're just trinkets though I mean hey? yeah I mean they're, they're, they're tucked away and they go in and out of fashion people get bored of them yeah um, they're not yeah I mean they're not they're, they're more like souvenirs of of a pilgrimage or something like that than they are of a sort of they're not sort of major worship okay fair them. enough uh, secondly um, the Euphrates altered its course. You had yeah, that on the lot. map. Why did it alter its course? Because there's nothing to stop it. There's no stone in southern Iraq. It's just earth. Right? It's a bit like East Anglia or the Netherlands. Yes. Right? And so a heavy flood, or just coming down from the mountains in, in Turkey, will just sort of drive down. And then, like any heavy river flood, it'll just want to find its, the, the quickest route out. So just like you find sort of meanders in... in Yes. In this country, where, where rivers have changed their course, the, the Tigris and Euphrates often shifted in, at flood time. So cities could suddenly, find, or even small villages, could suddenly find themselves a long way from water. So that's another reason why people might move. Well, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? There's a lady behind. Oh, there's, there's a lady just behind. There's you. also one up there there's as well. Oh, well, we'll, we'll but take this lady is. first, since she's there, and then this gentleman. Um, what do you see as the future of vulnerability from war danger in this area? Do you think it will, it will be vulnerable? No. That's good. I'm going to go back to that map. I don't know whether you were... I showed a map right at the beginning. Uh, ISIS is well over 200 miles away, and the latest news is in Ramadi. Um, the Iraqi army have just told people to evacuate Ramadi because they're going in. That's the nearest place to this. It's a long way away. Sorry, my slide, my laptop's running slow because the images are so big. Let me just um, come out. Um, maybe we could take another question while my laptop yes. is um, thinking about there. things. Sure. Thank you for a really interesting lecture. My pleasure. Not, not as many elephants as I was hoping for, but um, it was writing about elephants. Okay. Right. So you got the elephants at the end. So two two um, questions, I guess. Firstly, it looked very much like database tables, the records. Yeah. And have you had a forensic accountant look at them or somebody with that background? Um, because... That's my background. All oh, right, okay. I've, uh, I wrote a lot on the evolution of tables um, some years ago now. So there's a book called From Summa to Spreadsheets, Great. The History of Mathematical Tables. And the first chapter in it is by me. So I'll look yeah. that up. So it was, it was, I mean, the two things I'm interested in, I'm basically interested in the the social and um, political context of the production of knowledge. Um, and so I like mathematics and I like um, the Sumerian language. So it was just incredibly lucky in so many ways that I happened to be here at the right time when they found this archive. Because mm. without blowing my own trumpet too much, they couldn't have found any, a better fit if they'd searched all the historians in the world, the <laughs> sorts of stuff that they found. So. Yay. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, might, other I, thing, um, the apprentice scribe, yeah. Is there any suggestion that that might, or does it seem like that might be a relative of the person who was Almost there? certainly. And again, we've got no, no names, but when we do have names, um, they are um, usually sons, nephews, daughters, nieces. Um, yeah. Or you can, if you want to, your offspring to be trained by someone else, then you do apprenticeship by a formal adoption contract, so they de facto become the, the, the offspring of the, of the teacher. I'm getting there. We're almost at the, um, <coughs> the other slide. Yeah. Um, the old canal going down yeah. to her. Has anybody done any environmental ex investigations? Yes, there's a, um, a very good Iraqi um, who's finishing up, um, Jaffa Jothari, who's just finishing up a PhD at Durham University. We haven't um, particularly... Uh, um, connected with him yet and the environmental um, geological analysis is not my thing 
but um, we had, I had a, a preliminary meeting with him just last Saturday, so I've got no, haven't got any news yet, but we will soon. But he's gone, been going around taking um, geological samples of waterways from all across southern Iraq over the last couple of years, and has been working with um, an expert team in Durham to, to look at that. So soon we will know. Oh, it's dropped out. Dan, there we are. Sorry, that's my, that's my other half. <laughs> it, um, it's just a quickie. Um, you mentioned the ISIS. I'm not so much uh, worried about them. I know they're some distance away. But didn't the Americans cause a lot of damage in Ur? They did. Not uh, a lot. Not as, lo not as much as they did in Babylon. <laughs> um, uh, so Ur has been a military base since the 1920s when Britain um, had... Uh, a political mandate over Iraq. And one of the reasons that it was chosen as a base because the British archaeologist Leonard Woolley was working down there and it was quite convenient to fly in. So when Iraq gained independence from Britain in the 1930s, it took over the air base. And so in both in the 1991 war, um, it was a target for American attacks. And, um, and in fact, the Iraqi Air Force um, were, were, um, had sort of landed uh, aeroplanes actually all around the ziggurat at her kind of quite pro provocatively and really against uh, the 1954 Hague Convention. And then when the American army came in in 2003, they occupied both Ur and Babylon in a very well-meaning gesture to protect the sites from looting. They did that but caused a lot of inadvertent damage, much more so at Babylon than at Ur. Again, not deliberately, just moving heavy, heavy tanks around fragile archaeological sites is not the best move. Just ignorance, in other words. Yeah, just that, well, other priorities. Um, so it's still, on, it's still a military base now, an Iraqi military base, and that's one of the reasons it's so safe, is that we have a, we have a running route around the, um, the site, that goes around the edge of the, the air base, and we kind of wave to the, to the air force as we run in the mornings. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I, I think we're going to have to wrap it up now, um, but I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking um, Professor Robson. Thank you.